So hello, everybody, and welcome tonight. We are just about to get this uh, show on the road and get started with this Who Done It. Welcome to our virtual talk, uh, the Who Done It, the Shaw Gusher question. Uh, my name is Christina Sidorico. I am the Educational Program Coordinator here at the Oil Museum of Canada National Historic Site. I'll be the moderator for this evening's presentation. And I'm going to begin with some background information about Zoom before we all get started. You guys can use the chat box uh, with other webinar attendees or to message us or to create comments. If you want to send a message to the whole group, make sure you select all attendees or to everyone. To get the chat started, you're welcome to add some information where you're from or any other comments. You care more than welcome and highly encouraged to put questions in the Q&A box. So along the bottom of your screen, you'll see that there's a Q&A section questions can go in there. I'll be monitoring the chat and the Q&A throughout the program, and I'll be able to relay some of that information to Dana as she gets started. Um, this, record, this presentation is recorded tonight, and you will receive a link uh, after maybe in a day or two when with an email telling you that you can find it on our YouTube channel. So this will be uh, sent to you as a link, and it will be loaded onto our YouTube channel at the Oil Museum of Canada. Uh, where you can share it with friends or tell anybody about one of the awesome things that you learned tonight. So as this is one of our second presentations of this video series and this webinar series, I want to take a moment to introduce the museum. The Oil Museum of Canada is a designated National Historic Site. It's situated in the historic oil fields of Oil Springs, located in Ontario's first designated Industrial Heritage District and recognized under the Ontario Heritage Act. The museum preserves and interprets the important history of Lambton's innovation and global contributions to the pioneering oil industry, which is petroleum. Uh, the main exhibition center was constructed in 1960 and houses over 9,000 artifacts that interpret the history and influence of Lambton's proud petroleum heritage. In 2000, uh, 2021, we started the renovation project that closed our doors to the public for a full 12 months uh, to complete the capital improvements, replacing aging equipment and building systems that were beyond their life cycle and refresh the main exhibition gallery with more interpretive displays and new technology. There is some pretty awesome sweet tech in the museum right now. So you got to come out play with all the touch screens, try on the virtual reality headsets, look at our interactive walls. They're just dynamite. Um, the doors of the museum are currently open and we cannot wait for you to visit us. Time tickets can be booked on the website uh, at www.oilmuseum.ca or you can call the museum directly. Tonight, I am so excited and thrilled to introduce our guest speaker tonight is Dana Thorne. Dana is the Curator Supervisor at Lambton Heritage Museum in Grand Bend, Ontario. And they have an amazing site up there with so many cool and interesting things. She's been in that role since 2018. She worked previously as the archivist at Lambton County Archives in Wyoming, Ontario. And she got her start in the museum world as an intern at her beloved Oil Museum of Canada, where she got to do some of the research that we are discussing tonight. Um, Dana received her BA in history from the University of Alberta and her MA in public history from Western University. She sat on boards and committees for provincial organizations, including the Archives Association of Ontario and the Ontario Museum Association, known as the OMA. She is passionate about research, creating engaging visitor experiences at the museum and promoting our incredible local history because there are so many awesome stories and the best place to see them is to come and give us a visit either go up to Lambton Heritage Museum and go visit the swans that are coming in a few weeks and you can come visit us down at Lambton Her or at Oil Museum in Oil Springs at the other end of the county. So thanks for being with us here tonight Dana feel free to share your screen and get started. Um, I will be looking after the chat and the Q&A so I'm going to mute my microphone and toss it over to Dana. Well, thank you so much, Christina. I'm going to share here. And it is um, such a pleasure to be here tonight. And thank you to everyone who uh, took the time to join us and to um, listen to what I'm going to share. And um, as 
Christina said, they have a brand new exhibition at the Oil Museum of Canada. I had a chance to go last week and it's absolutely amazing. So if you um, have a chance to book a time and check it out, um, it's absolutely worth your while. So make sure that you head down to the Oil Museum as soon as you can. Um, as I get into my talk, I'm going to start by acknowledging the work of several scholars that came before me. Sometimes it can be intimidating to have a new perspective on the past and shake up established truths. Scholars that argued for John Shaw as the man who struck Canada's first oil gusher were fundamental in shifting the conversation. Fergus Cronin's article, Who Drilled the Great Shaw Well? in the Imperial Oil Review of April 1959, argued that John Shaw struck the gusher and bravely went against the grain. More recently, Earl Gray's excellent book, Ontario's Petroleum Legacy, The Birth, Evolution, and Challenges of a Global Industry, addressed some of the confusion about the history and passed the gusher crown to John Shaw. I'll be examining these sources in more detail later, but for now, a huge thank you to these fearless writers for their willingness to break the historical mold. The research I'm presenting today is drawn from my work as an intern at the Oil Museum of Canada in 2010, as Christina mentioned. Uh, yes, that was almost 12 years ago, and yes, that does make me feel old. If you're intrigued tonight and you want to read more about the Shaw Gusher question, including a full uh, bibliography of the sources I discussed today, you can read it online, and I can put um, that link in the chat for you a bit later. So I'm going to kickstart my presentation with a few oil history trivia questions um, to test your oil knowledge and see what you guys already know. And we're going to deliver these uh, via a poll. So you should see a poll pop up on your screen, um, and then you can select the answer that you think is appropriate. So the poll's right up there. Uh, can everybody see it? If you can't, put a, a thumbs down in the chat. So the question is, who invented the jerker line system to efficiently pump oil? So you can uh, click on uh, your thing uh, right there. Uh, people who were earlier might have seen the poll a little bit earlier. Uh, right now we have, I'm just gonna leave it up there for another 10 seconds, and then I will end the poll. And then you guys can let me know who invented the Jerkalon system. And no Googling if you don't know. All right. So we have 70% of participants. Um, some of you, I believe, can't see the poll. Um, I will make sure that you can see the second one. So I'm going to end the poll. I'm going to share the results. So hopefully everybody can see we have 17 people, 17% uh, of the participants think uh, James Miller Williams, uh, 7% think J Charles Tripp, 52% believe it was uh, John Henry Fairbank, and 24% believe it is Hugh Nixon Shaw. So and Dana? 52% of people are right. It was John Henry Fairbank sent to the Jerker line system. All right, let's go to our second question. So here's our second question. It should be live on your screen. What year was the first commercial oil well dug in Oil Springs? And the picture on the screen is a bit of a clue because that is the, uh, the, the gentleman who dug the first commercial oil well. I guess that doesn't help you with the year. but. <laughs> So we'll just give this a few more seconds here. We have about 90% participant rate. Um, I am going to close the poll now. So, so you guys should be able to see what year was the first commercial oil well, Doug? Dana, I'll let you answer this question. And 50% uh, got it right. So the year was 1858. That is the first commercial oil well in North America. So it's a pretty big deal. So let's launch question number three. When was the year of the gushers in oil springs that saw an unprecedented number of oil gushers? Was it A? Oh, I'm going to launch it. Sorry about that, folks. I read it, but I forgot to launch it.
All right, I'm going to close the poll. So Dana, what year was the year of the Gushers? We just had a big anniversary. It's 1862. Yes. We celebrated the 160th uh, anniversary, the year of the Gushers and the, uh, and the Shaw Gusher. So congratulations to those who got that right. All right, are we ready for question number four? Yes, we are. So who struck Canada's first oil gusher in 1862? Oh, I think we're ready to reveal it. So let's see, let's end the poll. And I'm gonna share the results and Dana's gonna tell us the answers. All right, well, there is a bit of a split here between people who think it was John Shaw and people who think it was Hugh Nixon Shaw. Um, I would argue it was John Shaw, but that's what we're gonna talk about tonight. <laughs> Thank you everyone for being such good sports and I hope you enjoyed the oil trivia. And uh, it gives you a, Bit of an introduction to some of the uh, some of the themes we're going to talk about tonight. Okay, so let's look at what we really know about our history by using an interesting case study. We'll be examining the identity of the man that drilled Canada's first oil gusher. There are two different men that have been recognized for this feat: Hugh Nixon Shaw and John Shaw. They were both active in oil springs at the time of the oil boom, but different history books have identified different men as the oil gusher king. How did our history textbooks get them mixed up? Before we look more carefully at this fascinating case study, I wanna talk a little bit about history in general. Who decides what gets written in the history books? How do we know that what's written in a history book is true? What if historians disagree about the truth from the past? As children, we read history books and assume everything in them is correct in the same way we would look at a math equation and know that two plus two is always four. But the reality in history is more complicated. The writers of those history books have their own faults and their own biases, uh, which can creep into their presentation of historical truth. They're also working with sources that might all, not always be correct. We'll examine both those problems in the context of the Shaw Gusher question. But first, I'm going to look a little bit into the philosophy about what history is and how historians write history. In preparing for this presentation, I literally dusted off one of my old history textbooks from my undergraduate degree. Um, and it was Rethinking History by Keith Jenkins. And I pulled this quote to share with you. Um, Jenkins wrote, the past and history are different things. They are not stitched into each other such that only one historical reading of the past is absolutely necessary. The past and history float free of each other. They are ages and miles apart. For the same object of inquiry can be read differently by different discursive practices. A landscape can be read or interpreted differently by geographers, sociologists, historians, artists, or economists. Jenkins paths a lot into this quotation. He makes a very interesting distinction between the past and history. The past is the culmination of everything that came before us, the events that actually occurred. In contrast, History is our interpretation of those events or how they're remembered and talked about. Jenkins also asserts that the same item can be read differently depending on your perspective. A geologist will look at a picture of a landscape and see very different things than an artist looking at exactly the same picture. Even within disciplines, two artists looking at the same landscape will interpret it differently. These varying perspectives are just as relevant for historians in their study and writing of history. Two historians reading the same newspaper article can come away from it with two very different readings of the past. We've seen different perspectives on the past come to a head in Canada and around the world as we reevaluate statues and monuments. Many voices are calling for statues to be erected that celebrate women and minority groups, which have traditionally been overlooked in favor of statues commemorating the deeds of powerful white men. These changing perspectives have culminated in the removal of statues across Canada. On this slide, a statue of John A. Macdonald is removed from the front steps of Victoria, BC's City Hall. Macdonald has been celebrated across Canada as our first prime minister and a powerful political force. But in recent years, his history has been re-examined. 
While he served as prime minister, McDonald's government oversaw the Indian Act and established the residential school system. These government systems oppressed indigenous people and stripped them of their culture, their language, and their dignity. CBC News reported in August 2018 that city councillors in Victoria voted to have a monument of McDonald removed because of his role as a leader of violence against indigenous peoples. The same man who was so often celebrated is now being seen through a very different lens. The intersection of the past and history continue to manifest itself as we're challenged to reconsider people and events of the past through a more critical lens. The history is changing even if the past hasn't changed. Looking back one more time to Keith Jenkins, before we delve into the Shaw Gusher question, he wrote, the past has occurred. It has gone and can only be brought back again by historians in a very different media. For example, in books, articles, documentaries, not as actual events. The past has gone in history is what historians make of it when they go to work. Shifting back to the Shaw Gusher question, how important is oil history to the County of Lambton? And how important is it that we get that history right? I would argue that the local oil history is central to the identity of Lambton County, critical to our economy, and has helped define our significance in Canadian and international history. But how can we tell which story is right when the history books don't agree? How important is it that we have the right information about the oil boom that took place in Oil Springs in the 1860s? So let's examine a historical controversy that has plagued our county and divided historians into two camps, Hugh Nixon Shaw and John Shaw. Who was it that really drilled that first oil gusher? And how did the story get so mixed up? We're going to start with a quick video. Uh, the subject is particularly timely because January 2022 marks the 160th anniversary of the Shaw Gusher strike and historians love to celebrate anniversaries. In this video, you'll see a reenactment of the moment that the first oil gusher was struck in Oil Springs. For those that are completely unfamiliar with the history, in 1858, the first com commercial oil well in North America was dug in Oil Springs. Oil fever came to a boiling point in 1862 when men started pumping wells and striking oil gushers that spewed oil into the sky. As the value of the resource became better understood and people started to appreciate the amount of oil that was available in oil springs, men were gobbling up lots to strike their fortunes. Wells were being drilled at a remarkable rate as men vied with each other to capture the black gold. On January 16, 1862, one man hit the jackpot. And this video is from the uh, introductory video that you watch when you arrive at the oil museum. Seems everyone around him is getting rich while he drills deeper and deeper on his one measly acre with nary a drop of oil to show for it. The poor man's been jumping on his spring pole for months, pounding into the rock. They laugh at crazy Shaw. His cash and credit are long, long gone. Yesterday, he couldn't even get the credit for a pair of shoes. Just one more day, he said this morning. If I don't get anything today, I'm packing it in. It was about 10 o'clock on Friday morning at 158 feet from the surface. The oil was struck and it came rushing up with a will. Not giving time for the workmen to gather their implements, filling the well in 15 minutes and shooting up a column of oil some 20 feet in the air and hundreds of barrels of oil were flowing around the well, over the road, and into the creek. And so it continued day and night until Monday morning. All right. Oops, let me get back to my slides. Perfect. So I'm going to start uh, with what I learned about Hugh Nix and Shaw through an examination of primary sources. Then I'll review what primary sources had to say about John Shaw. Newspaper articles from the Toronto Globe and the Hamilton Times in 1861 and 1862 refer to Hugh Shaw as a successful businessman who patented a still and opened a refinery in Oil Springs. An article that appeared in the Toronto Globe on September 2nd, 1861, uh, refers to Hugh's new refining process. Oops. Slide behind. Uh, makes it clear that Hugh has been actively involved in the oil industry and was present in oil springs, so there's no doubt that he was working in the area. The Globe published a series of four articles in 1861 about the oil discoveries in oil springs. Keep them in mind because they'll be important later in my talk. 
for now, here's a quote from one of them, which has nothing to do with the oil gusher, just about Hugh's other activities. It says, when the sun shines upon the oil, green, blue, red, and brown colors sparkle upon its surface. These colors, Mr. Hugh Shaw of Toronto says, he can extract at a cheap rate from the refuse oil after refining. They will form a superior description of unfading dyes in paints. Mr. Shaw is about patenting the discovery and also a process of refining the oil, which he believes will considerably reduce its price and what is equally desirable, completely deodorize it. Hugh Shaw actually died in a tragic accident on February 11th, 1863. The Christian Guardian reported that his death was occasioned by suffocation from inhaling obnoxious gases while in an oil well, into which he had descended for the purpose of pulling up a piece of gas pipe, was within about 15 feet of the surface, was heard to be breathing heavily when he fell back into the oil and disappeared. Many in the community were shaken by his early death. Um, his obituaries mentioned nothing about an oil discovery in 1862. I would uh, like to thank Pat McGee from Fairbank Oil Fields for allowing me to use this beautiful picture of the Shaw well that's on this slide. Um, her husband, Charlie Fairbank, is the fourth generation oil driller on their land in Oil Springs. And he erected a three pole derrick at the site of the Shaw well on their property. And you can see it in this wintry shot. Additionally, uh, Pat wrote an excellent blog about the 160th anniversary of the Shaw Gusher and it's available on the Fairbank Oil Fields website. Um, I can put the link in the chat uh, later if you wanna check that out as well. So now that we've talked about Hugh Nixon Shaw, what do we know about John Shaw? He was also an oil driller active in oil springs. He was a significantly less successful businessman and significantly more scruffy. Apparently John was a bit of a scoundrel and a drifter. He had been reported to have lived in Kingston, Strathroy and Port Huron before making his way to oil springs to try for a fortune. After his time in oil springs, he ended up as a photographer in Petrolia. I find this ironic since I could never find a good picture of him. And the best picture that I um, could find of him was this very, very grainy portrait. Um, he died in Petrolia in 1871, but we don't know for sure where he was buried. The Toronto Globe described on February 2nd, 1862, what life was like for John Shaw before the gusher strike. Last January, found him a ruined, hopeless man, leered at by his neighbors, his pockets empty, his clothes in tatters. The story that's often repeated, and the one we heard in the video earlier, that John was refused credit for a pair of shoes on the morning they struck the oil gusher. It's hard to believe that this profile fits Hugh Nixon Shaw. Uh, we saw from the earlier Globe articles that Hugh was operating refineries as a well-respected member of the community before the gusher was drilled. Whether the man who drilled the gusher is identified as Hugh Nixon Shaw or John Shaw, the story generally remains the same. Shaw is characterized as a down on his luck man, chastised by his neighbors, almost completely broke when the gusher was struck in January, 1862. He couldn't even afford shoes and had to keep wearing his ratty ones. Newspaper articles commented that before the gusher, he was an undesirable figure in the community, but after he struck oil, he became referred to as a Mr. Shaw. This characterization doesn't match what we know about Hugh Nixon, who was a staunch Methodist and a savvy businessman. He was one of four men to lay out the village of Oil Springs in 1860. He was a successful merchant in Cooksville and as early as the summer of 1861 had patented a still for distilled oils. He also owned and operated local refineries. This man can't be reconciled with the tale of Shaw who brought up the first oil gusher. However, John Shaw who worked odd jobs and moved, moved often is much more believable as the community clown who couldn't afford a pair of shoes the morning he struck lucky. In fact, there are no references to Hugh and the oil gusher in any of the 1860s newspapers from the time that the gusher was struck. Any references to Hugh in the 1860s papers talk about his refinery business and his presence in oil springs, but there's nothing about the legendary oil gusher. Here are four examples from the early 1860s that identified John Shaw specifically as the man who struck the gusher. The Hamilton Times proclaimed on January 20th, 1862, Mr. John Shaw from Kingston, Canada West, tapped a vein of oil in his well. The present enormous flow of oil cannot be estimated at less than 2,000 barrels per day. None of these articles published in January and February when the gusher was struck mentioned Hugh Nixon. 
Another primary source that we can look at is land records. These land records from 1862 show John Shaw owning land in Oil Springs on Lot 18, Concession 2, where the oil gusher was struck. You can see this in the, Im the image at the bottom of the screen on the left. Unixon's name doesn't appear anywhere as an owner of land on that lot in concession. Additionally, a, uh, a list that is attributed to a Mrs. Robinson um, listing significant oil wells from 1862 clearly lists John Shaw as owning one of the flowing wells and the name Hunix and Shaw just doesn't appear. One of my favorite uh, pieces of this oil gusher puzzle comes from the journal of John Henry Fairbanks. John Henry was a significant figure in the early history of oil springs. He invented the jerker line system that allowed a single engine to pump multiple wells at the same time. The Fairbanks have now been pumping oil in oil springs for four generations, operating as a family business since 1861. And their oil fields continue to use the 19th century technology that was invented by John Henry. So um, back to his journal. He kept a journal between 1862 and 1864. He wrote this delightful passage about working with Shaw in the oil business on November 13th, 1862. That Shaw peddling oil, he is a big ass would do a smashing business at selling molasses, candy, and peanuts. Ye gods, what money he would make at training dogs. This sounds to me like penniless photographer John Shaw and not a respected businessman, Phoenix and Shaw. I found five other references to Shaw in Fairbanks Journal, and uh, one of them specifically referred to Hugh Nix and Shaw, which is the first listed on the slide here. Uh, they discussed general business dealings and nothing about a peddling ass. These notes include a sad reflection on February 11th, 1863, the day that Hugh Nixon Shaw died. Wrote, poor Mr. H. N. Shaw drowned in his well today. In him, I have lost one of my best friends in Inniskillen, a good man and most obliging neighbor. Sad, sad, sad calamity. John Henry Fairbanks Journal supports the characterization of two different Shaws, the well-respected businessman Hugh Nixon and the scoundrel John. Speaking of journals, Hugh Nixon Shaw kept a journal of his own. He wrote in this journal between 1861 and 1863. You can see a few of the pages of the journal on this slide. I highlighted his name um, on the top at the left where it was written expenses of H.N. Shaw. He recorded information about business transactions, income and payments from his early days working in oil production until his death. The journal also contains an analysis of his assets was conducted by his son Bartholomew after he died. This journal shows he had substantial business transactions with many significant oil producers in the area. Uh, records of expenses for September and October 1861 show that Hugh was hiring laborers, selling conductors, traveling to London, lending out drilling tools, and selling timber. He was an active member of the community, he needed business with the most important oil, oil dealers in the area, yet a steady and a prosperous business. This figure just can't be read, reconciled with the barefoot penniless Shaw who brought in Canada's first oil gusher. Additionally, I couldn't find anything in the journal about the oil gusher. Had Hugh actually brought in the gusher, wouldn't he have recorded it? Even if he didn't write in his journal that he'd struck the gusher, his business transaction and income records should reflect substantial fluctuations, you would think. The absence of a record of a specific event is an evidence that that event didn't happen, but I think it's just another indication that Hugh Nixon Shaw did not strike the gusher. The obituaries for both John Shaw and his wife Jane referenced the oil gusher strike. The Sarnia Observer reported on his death and also provided some insight into what life was like for him after the strike. The piece entitled Death of a Well-Known Oil Man was published on July 21st, 1871. It actually names him as James Shaw, uh, sometimes in the sources, we'll see the name James instead of John, just another added layer of confusion and complexity to the history puzzle. And so the obituary reads, Mr. James B. Shaw, one of the pioneers of the Canadian oil business and the person who owned one of the original fl flowing wells at Oil Springs, died last week at Petrolia. When Mr. Shaw struck this flowing well, he was looked upon at the time as a veritable millionaire. But his oil at that time only brought about 10 cents a barrel and there was no proper means of saving the supply, a large quantity of which ran to waste. Moreover, as the supply soon gave out, the illusion of Mr. Shaw's wealth gave out with it. Since that time, he'd been struggling on in comparative poverty. 
dying at the early age of 40 years. Nine years later, John's wife, Jane, also passed away. And the Petrolia Public Topic um, published this obituary on February 26, 1880. On Sunday morning last, Jane, relic of the late John Shaw, died at the age of 48 years from inflammation of the lungs. Her husband, who died nine years ago from the same complaint, was well known here from his connection with the petroleum trade, having struck at oil springs in the month of January 1862, the largest producing oil well ever struck in the world. So two obituaries that mention the oil gusher and Hugh Nixon's obituary was completely silent on this topic. Sometimes when you're doing research, you find a photograph or a newspaper article that's so compelling, it feels just electric. These flashing moments of discovery are one of the things that I love about research and one of the reasons that I pursued a career in museum and archives. Sometimes these discoveries come when your eyes are strained from being hunched over a microfilm machine scanning through grainy newspapers for hours. I had one of those wonderful moments when I found an article that was published in the Sarnia Observer on May 11th, 1866. The article reported, Mr. John Shaw, who suddenly found himself famous one day in 1862, is about to give the old spot another good try over again. This was published three years after Hugh Nixon Shaw's death in 1863. Couldn't possibly be referring to Hugh Nixon Shaw, and it states specifically that John Shaw is going back to his famous well to try it again. Uh, spoiler alert, he failed. It didn't work. Historical accounts in newspaper articles describing the history of oil production in Inniskillen consistently refer to John or James Shaw until 1940. Um, I have five of those uh, sources are up on this slide with brief descriptions of how they mention John or James Shaw. Um, again, all of this information and a full bibliography is available in my um, report, which I can put in the chat if you would like to check that out in more detail later. But historians that were writing about this before 1940 were almost unanimously attributing the gusher to John Shaw. There is a notable exception, and that was the Belden Illustrated Historical Atlas of 1880, which clearly attributed the gusher to Hugh Shaw. It is an anomaly, and my investigation concluded that it was a mistake by the compiler of the atlas, who was confused by early Toronto Globe reports about Hugh's activities in the oil industry. This caused one of the major turning points in the historical literature and launched an ill-fated work by Colonel Robert Harkness in 1940, who asserted that Hugh Nixon Shaw drilled the gusher. Before I look at exactly what the Belden Atlas had to say about the oil gusher, I wanna take a moment to highlight this amazing historical resource. Uh, these atlases were compiled in the early 1880s for counties across Ontario. Um, so you can find them for counties other than Lambton if you're interested. They provide very valuable information about local residents and descriptions of villages and cities that include details like the number of schools that were there or the number of businesses. Uh, the original Lambton Atlas was republished in 1973 and you can access it at the Lambton Carriage Museum, Lambton County Archives, or the reference section of some of our local libraries. You can also purchase a reprint online from Ontario Ancestors, formerly the Ontario Genealogical Society. Uh, one of the things I love about the atlases are these great sketches of different farm properties that you can find. They provide these wonderful panoramic views and a perspective that you don't usually see in photographs from this period. So what did the Belden Atlas have to say about Phoenix and Shaw? That the first glowing well was struck by Hugh Shaw, originally a photographer from Strathroy, who came here in the early days of the oil discovery, invested all he had in the purchase and development of oil territory, and was one of four, the others being J.M. Williams, James Thompson, and W.E. Sanborn, who laid out the village in 1860. Just before he made this strike, he had been reduced by his want of success to such pecuniary straits that it is related of him that the very day he struck oil, he was refused credit for a pair of boots. This is a combination of elements from Hugh Nixon Shaw's story and John Shaw's story. We see the name Hugh Shaw, but we also say that, see that it says he was a photographer from Strathroy and the reference to financial hardship. It also says that Hugh Nixon was one of the four who laid out the village of Oil Springs in 1860. That sounds more like the Hugh Nixon Shaw who was a sophisticated businessman and operating successful refineries in Oil Springs when the gusher struck in 1862. That doesn't sound like ratty John Shaw. From my reading, this primary source from 1880 clearly takes elements from the two Shaw stories and presents part of John Shaw's story under the name 
Shaw. What I would argue was a mistake in the 1880 Belden Atlas led us to a significant publication in this Shaw Gusher question. Colonel Robert Harkness was the oil and gas commissioner of Ontario and released the book Makers of Oil History in 1940. Until his book, all of the secondary sources used the name John or James Shaw in their writing. Um, going back to the, the list of sources I had on a previous slide. Harkness decided to break the convention and came down hard in the Hugh-Nixon camp. Harkness wrote with considerable conviction about the Toronto Globe series of articles from 1861. He said, the Globe correspondent calls him Hugh Shaw, as do all contemporary writers, and says he had considerable experience in California and is about to effect, erect a refinery and patent a process for refining oil as well as extracting colors therefrom. His home is variously assigned to Kingston and Toronto, but in his obituary notice, it is given as Cooksville, Ontario. Harkness is correct that the Globe correspondent is talking about Hugh Nix and Shaw, but these articles were written more than four months before the gusher burst, so I think they're pretty irrelevant to the discussion. Harkness offers no additional compelling evidence that Hugh Nix and Shaw was the gusher man, and he brushes off all the newspaper accounts that identified the man as John Shaw. In a half page of handwritten notes that were attached to an early copy of his Makers of Oil History book, Harkness extended his discussion of John Shaw, noting, in the Lambton County Directory of 1864 to 65, here will be found John Shaw, oil land proprietor, thereby making it clear that there were two Shaws. How John Shaw could live in Petrolia, enjoying the glory of his gallant pioneer namesake, Hugh Nixon Shaw, along with men who knew this to be incorrect, is extraordinary. After Harkness, other historians and journalists began to cite Hugh and John's name started to fade from history. The book Makers of Oil History and Harkness's erroneous scholarship shaped the work of historians that came after them. Victor Lauriston's extremely influential work, Lambton County's Hundred Years, was published in 1949. Lauriston had read Harkness's book. He cites the same 1861 newspaper article series from the Toronto Globe. Additionally, Lauriston claims the daily issues of the Globe from 1861 to 1866 and the annual reports published each January from 1867 to 73 make no reference whatever in connection with the oil fields to any John or James Shaw. In fact, that's not correct because the Globe featured a lengthy article on February 5th, 1862 called A Promising Trade, which uh, referenced John Shaw as the man who drilled the gusher. Lauriston's was one of the first comprehensive histories of Lambton County and a book that many historians coming after him would have read it and cited. It perpetuated the mistakes that Harkness had made in 1940. But it does have a lot of valuable information in it as well. You can find used copies online if you'd like to purchase one, or you can check it out in the reference uh, sections at the Lambton Heritage Museum, the Lambton County Archives, and some of our local library branches. This leads us to a big party in the village of Oil Springs. When Oil Springs celebrated the 100th anniversary of James Miller Williams' first commercial oil well in 1958, a flurry of articles credited Hugh Nixon with the oil gusher discovery. On this slide is a picture that was published in the Sarnia Observer on June 30th, uh, 1958. And it shows a reenactment of the striking of the first oil gusher. This was part of the anniversary festivities. The Sarnia Observer article clearly credits Hugh Nixon Shaw as the gusher man. They were working from Harkness and Lauriston secondary sources. They also had an inside track with an actual descendant of Hugh Nixon Shaw who came to Oil Springs to join the party. The Reverend William G. Shaw, Hugh's grandson, traveled to Oil Springs in 1958 for the anniversary year. William's participation in the Shaw celebrations pushed John Shaw out of the history. A lengthy article published in the Sarnia Observer on July 2nd, 1958 is featured on this slide and includes this quotation from William. I was quite surprised to find that there were write-ups about the Shaw well in the newspapers. Father referred to it occasionally, but never attached any importance to it. I find it funny that William was surprised to hear about the Shaw well. Of course, Hugh Nixon Shaw didn't talk about it because it wasn't his well. The, uh, the Oil Museum of Canada opened shortly after these 100th anniversary celebrations in 1960. On this slide is a letter written by the, the grandson, William G. Shaw, to the museum's first curator, Beatrice McLaughlin, indicating he was sending her family pictures to help better tell the story of Hugh Nixon Shaw. This even further cemented Hugh's prominence. 
and he was then being interpreted at the Oil Museum of Canada as the first gusher man. Sometimes major events like the 1958 anniversary can entrench incorrect assumptions about the past and the new story gains a momentum of its own. It takes a brave historian to go against the grain, um, especially assumptions that are entrenched as fact and have been repeated in multiple history books. It may even be as dramatic as a gladiator showdown. Earl Gray's book, Ontario Petroleum Legacy, The Birth, Evolution and Challenges of a Global Industry was one of the first books written recently that asserted John Shaw brought in the gusher. Gray points to the 1940s and 1950s in the publications of Harkness and Lauriston as the point when the confusion of Hugh Nixon Shaw and John Shaw arose. Gray goes on to provide some references to 1862 newspaper descriptions of Shaw and asserts that the known contemporary records identify the discoverer as John Shaw, while almost every account since the 1950s credits Hugh Shaw. Given the new research, uh, interpretation at the Oil Museum of Canada is being updated to credit John Shaw with the oil gusher discovery. However, many sources remain um, published in print and online that credit Hugh Nixon Shaw. So who done it? In conclusion, my research indicates that John Shaw was the man who struck that legendary oil gusher back in January 1862. History and the past are two separate things, and it appears that history got confused in the mid-20th century with the work of several well-intentioned historians. As museum professionals and historians, we do our best to interpret the sources we have available and tell the stories of the past. Hopefully, we will continue to examine our history critically and try to present the most accurate version of the past possible. Um, I've included my contact information on this slide, and if you know anything about the two Shaws, please reach out to me and I would love to talk to you. Um, it could be as simple as my grandfather was a colleague of John Shaw's grandson or any other tidbits you might have heard around town. Uh, sometimes those informal snippets can be very useful. I continue to be intrigued by the Shaw Gusher question and um, would love to hear anything that anybody else has to add to the discussion. So thank you for your time tonight and I'm happy to take questions. So friends, you are more than welcome to uh, to go to the chat or you can put a question in the Q&A. Uh, we'll be able to read those. Uh, I can't, if you raise your hand, that's awesome. But if you raise your hand, I can't see anything that you've, uh, you've put. So uh, please type it into the chat or please put it in the Q&A so we can uh, be able to answer it, please. But I'm fascinated by this. This is something that uh, I run into work at all the time up at the Oil Museum, Who done it? Uh, we are constantly running into different interpretation panels and we are looking for primary source research to find out what is the story. And one historian said this and a different historian said this. And we always need to go back to those primary sources, those newspaper articles that were written at the time, those diary entries, um, because we can get mixed up. And I know there are historians that swore up and down that it was Hugh Nixon Shaw um, or, or something like that because of what it was in a diary entry. Um, and it's because somebody forgot to put the first name down. <laughs> so I'm still looking to see, do we have uh, any questions or concerns, feel free to type them into uh, the chats. Um, so then, agrees with me. <laughs> so I see that Ken Burns has raised his hand. I'm going to uh, to see uh, Ken. What's your or Karen? Sorry, I'm so sorry, Karen. Um, tell us, uh, type what you want or. Um, if you want to say anything, go right ahead. So we have um, a comment from Kevin. Very interesting, great presentation, very compelling evidence from long ago to prove the prior records otherwise. Great research and evidence to back it up. Uh, Hughes Business versus John Riggs seems to be uh, the driving factor. Yes, we have um, two very different characters involved in this story. Um, 
and and there are many different interpretations of why there are characters like that. One was an astute businessman and and a godly man um, who was well respected by his peers and very well liked. And one was as um, was known a bit of an ass. <laughs> What? Bit of an ass. <laughs> what happened there? I don't know. <laughs> so, does John Shaw have any known descendants? That's a good question, and not that I came across in my research. But if anybody knows, um, I, I would love to hear about it because I think that would be um, fascinating. Um, we him, have him and his wife were both relatively young when they died. They were uh, 40 and 48. But I um, don't ever heard anything about, about their children or about any descendants. So. Did anything it, appear in their ob obits about children? No mention of children in the obituaries, just the gusher. Okay. Um, we have a question from Bob. He wants to know, how did they cap the gusher? I know that a lot of the oil just um, flew away. <laughs> And, and went into the streams and a lot of the oil was lost. Um, I don't know, Christine, if you have any insight into the... Um, so we do know that it took three days uh, for them to bring the, the gusher under control. Uh, the information that we have up at the oil museum is that they used leather bags filled with flax um, as a part of a, a packing system. And this was a technology that they imported from um, our American neighbors in Pennsylvania. They had a more extensive research with gushers and uh, that's because they were torpedoing wells um, and so they were able to to cap it with these leather bags filled with flaxseed uh, the water and the oil would get into the leather and it would swell and it would control the flow but about 90 percent of it went down the black creek and that year the year of the gushers was really important um, because so much oil went down the Black Creek into the Sydenham and into the St. Clair River system that it was known to scuff and soil the hulls of the ships uh, that were eventually pulling into the ports of Toronto. So we do have extensive reports of the environmental contamination and spills um, affecting the shipping. Also dramatic stories about the oil on the creeks um, being on fire. Yes. It's looking like it. it's burning inferno. Uh, so in Belden's Atlas, I think it's it's reported that it looks like a fire drake uh, or fire the breath of a fiery dragon. And if you're looking for more information, we do have videos on YouTube about the fires. Um, and we will probably be coming out with one about the burning of Black Creek, um, which it happened several times. So we have, uh, is John Henry Fairbanks Journal part of the Oil Museum or still with the Fairbank Collection? Um, is uh, still with the Fairbanks family. So, uh, in a transcription was done um, of Charles Oliver Fairbanks' journal that, that I've seen that um, can be available to researchers that want to review that transcription. I'm not sure if the transcription was the son of John, John Henry's or not, but if, if there was, it would be available at the Lampton County Archives. Uh, I'm unaware of the answer to that. I do know the Fairbanks still have the diary. Um, but I don't know if there's transcriptions. So if you want, give us a call at the museum on Monday when I'm back in or on Saturday and I will find the answer for you. Uh, in the Q&A, Brian is asking, the fact that John Shaw owned land is pretty conclusive and what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that was one of the things that I was really happy um, to find was seeing that he had actually purchased part of this lot 18 on the second concession and seeing that Hugh Nixon Shaw had not. Um, and the, the land records for oil springs at that time are, are pretty wild to go through because so many of the lots were being subdivided into such tiny little pieces as people were buying, you know, these, these little little spits of land to try to, um, to drill their wells to strike their fortunes. So that was um, interesting to go through. Yeah, it's pretty interesting to, to see that oil springs is a bit like Swiss cheese. Um, people were, it was a boom town in the very purest sense of a boom town with this black gold rush. And you had, you had some uh, shystering going on. So people were salting the wells, um, people were trading them back and forth. And because we hadn't been incorporated into a country yet at that period of time, regulations were quite limited. 
Uh, so you could buy land and as plunk as many holes down as you wanted in that land, uh, provided you could make a profit, um, which led to, to some of the problems we experienced later in the oil industry about pressurizing wells um, in an environment that looks like Swiss cheese. So Bob is asking, is the gusher on museum property? No. So the gusher is on uh, the Fairbank oil fields property, which is the, right beside right beside the museum. So that's where the original gusher is. But there's like a, a brief full derrick recreation of the Shaw gusher on the oil museum property. Yeah, so we do have a recreation. And if you visit us in the summertime, hopefully uh, public health regulations will allow us to have wagon tours again. And if you come on one of our wagon scheduled wagon tours, we do travel uh, to see the Shaw Gusher on Fairbank Oil property by horse and wagon, which is just lovely. It's a it's an amazing uh, day out. You come to the museum and you can go on a, a wagon tour with one of our summer students. And they tell you all sorts of wonderful history bits. So we have another comment in the chats. Uh, Hugh Shaw had refineries noted prior to the gusher. Were these from uh, oil collected from the surface oil or from gum beds? And what oil uh, or, or what oil were refineries refining prior to the first commercial oil gusher? Uh, that was their main feedstock. So the first commercial oil gusher was 1858. And um, um, 1858 is the first well. And the gusher oh, was 1862. Was 1862. Um, they, so they were still drilling prior to the, the first gusher that kind of burst dramatically out of the ground in 1862. So even though there wasn't um, any gushers before 1862, they were still drilling wells prior to that. So based on the information that I've collected up at the museum and that's been passed down to us through the museum's um, different avenues, is James Miller Williams dug the first well in 1858. It was only 14 feet deep. Um, the Americans in 1859 drilled a well. So Colonel Drink uh, drilled his well. So it's the first drilled well. But shortly thereafter, um, James Miller Williams was drilling because you were, if the deeper you went, the more oil you were able to produce. It's just that uh, John Shaw was the first to cap, uh, crack that cap rock that allowed that huge volume to, to gush out of the ground. Um, there is an old expression that uh, oil springs is an oil business, but it has a natural gas problem. Um, there, is, there was prior to 1862 a lot of natural gas pressure that caused those flowing wells that pushed that oil rate to the surface, which is why in 1862 is the year of the gushers. After that, they'd released so much pressure that then you had to start pumping the oil. You didn't have these flowing wells the way that you do now. Um, but yeah, they were still using liquid crude. I think it was only the trips that were using um, the gum beds or the indigenous populations. Sorry for button in there, but I'm fascinated by this. This is this is my. The oil museum's my my home away from home. So, any other questions, friends? Any other comments? Um, anything else that you'd like to add or let Dana know before we uh, wrap it up for the evening and everybody can get all snugly at home? Well, I want to, uh, on behalf of the Oil Museum of Canada, I want to thank Dana for being our guest speaker tonight. Um, her presentation was interesting and fabulous. I'm always um, interested to know all the things that she's researched and, and done. Um, we want to have you come and support your local museum. So my friends, tonight, this was an awesome virtual presentation, but we hope to see you all out in person, either at Lambton Heritage Museum or at the Oil Museum of Canada at some point in the future when you feel safe to doing so. Um, your support is critical for allowing us to continue to preserve and share our local history and the stories from our community. Uh, the recording of tonight's talk will be available shortly on YouTube uh, for the Oil Museum of Canada. And we hope to see you again at our next virtual talk in May, where we're going to learn about some of the international drillers, particularly 
William McGarvey and his oil business. William McGarvey was one of the first mayors of Petrolia, and then he went overseas and made a fortune um, in Galicia, Poland, um, and Russia, and uh, some other really interesting tidbits about how his daughters married into aristocratic nobility. So we're going to hear some of those stories um, in May. So I hope you all join us then. In the meantime, feel free to check out um, all the sites here at Lambton County, whether that is Lambton County Archives, to do your own research, uh, Lambton Heritage Museum up in Grand Bend, or come visit us here at the OMZ of Canada. Have a wonderful evening, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Christina. All righty, I'll talk to you all later. I'm going to end the recording.